academic hands theater is the place where they both meet. We have the audience and participants for each other. These natural practices are starting to practice this culture. I know. Everybody from this. Examples of women sharing what it is that you two share and how you do that. There's no way you can ignore that point anymore. We're from all around. You can come and sit and talk about it. everybody to the Martin Siegel Theater Center here at the Graduate Center CUNY on a, a Monday afternoon. And um, with me is Karen, whose uh, book uh, we honor, but actually we honor in a way her life and work uh, for this theater. And I think it's documented in that book. It's a great uh, cause for celebration. And yes, and it's also for applause. And we thought to have uh, two parts to the day of the celebration of uh, her plays in time, over time, and um, in the afternoon we have a full reading, and uh, Karen will say a little bit more about it in the evening at 6.30. We have a discussion, but also excerpts from three other plays you all will see in your um, printout. Uh, before I give the mic to Karen, please do take out your cell phone. I'll do the same. And I put it, it is. So now let's see. It should say silent. Off. And it never rings in our readings, it's really uh, true, so thank you for doing this. The reading should be about an hour, we have a little discussion afterwards. The evening will be about 90 minutes, and we have a reception here in the space, and afterwards, if so everybody's willing, we go to a little bar around the corner. But again, really, thank you for coming and uh, celebrating and honoring Karen's uh, work. And uh, Karen. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much for coming, distinguished audience. <laughs> Scholars, writers, friends, who do designers, <laughs> uh, photographers, thank you so much. Um, so I just want to say, this is a two-hour play, and we are reading excerpts from it. I tried to tell a story uh, that you can follow, but there is much that is left out, obviously. Uh, we can talk about that uh, afterwards. But I think there is a, well, I think there's a story here. First, play, first readings for a playwright are, of course, like watching your baby take a step. So I um, count on you all to embrace my baby. Thank you so much. takes place inside the dome, a hermetically sealed environment where the privileged remnants of society, plus a few workers, have taken shelter. Part two takes place in a clearing outside the dome where the denuded nature is struggling to come back in late fall and winter with 90 degree Fahrenheit heat and on a road during a storm in a cave. Part three takes place in, <coughs> excuse me, takes place in and around the clearing as the spring soaring temperatures approaches. Characters. Michelle Ormick, an obstetrician gynecologist played by Christian Clifford. Eve, a neuroscientist demoted to position of part-time lecturer played by Caitlin Nassima Cassidy. Hmm. Tanaka, form, formerly a physician, is a refugee from far away allowed into the dome to do labor and so that the radiation 
and so that the radiation concentration in his bones can be monitored and studied, <coughs> played by Paul Price. Opa, a renowned public intellectual, a linguist, and grandfather of Eve, played by George Bartini. We will, we will, we will, we will be reading selected scenes from parts one and three of the play. <coughs> Scene one. Inside the sparsely furnished room of Eve and Michelle, early morning from outside. The sounds of marching feet shuffling, perhaps a low morning song, and loudspeakers issuing incoherent, menacing directives. There they go. They have been judged. Absolutely. Who must get up so early? I have to go to work. Parades of exiles can arouse conflicting feelings. I'm relieved, actually. Excess population drains limited resources. After all, it's not us. Stay in bed until the line passes your house. The line will soon pass. I've got petri dishes full of fetuses to diagnose. Women are able to carry to term the mandatory viable birth will be exiled. Women are wearing out. Michelle takes a drink from an open wine bottle. Make it 7 a.m. The dregs from last night. Women are not wearing out. Of course not. You are obedient, still in bed. I am weeping. No, you are not. Just wondering, what was weeping? When? There was weeping. I'll open a new bottle. <laughs> Somewhere, wild things are growing. Levels of radiation and pollutant particles outside the dome remain lethal. Mm. Dream. Must have been. Eve hands Michelle a piece of paper. Michelle takes it and reads it intently during the following exchange. Hmm. We are on the mandatory list to conceive. That is what you do. Both of us. <laughs> Implant eggs into wombs. It must be very satisfying for you. Precisely. I hope so. Very, very true. I'm glad. But yours? Is there a problem with that? Mm. When looked at like this? You mustn't, you mustn't think of it as a demotion. Oh, think again. I love lecturing. We're both quite on track. Michelle quietly rips and then eats the pieces of paper. <laughs> oh. <laughs> you agree? I do, absolutely. She takes a large drink to wash the paper mm. bits down. Oh, so darling, please. Don't drink so much. Off to work, both of us. <laughs> Scene two. Michelle in their room with a large goblet and an open bottle of red wine. She takes a drink as Eve enters with Tanaka, standing some distance behind her. It's very good, this Cote de Rhone. Mick, I will get us a case. Amazing wine survived. Mm. Aged underground. Is it full light? Full-bodied tart with a lemony tang. Oh, lemony, what a nice word. Mm, perhaps it's just the chemicals, though. Let me taste. She reaches inside Michelle's pocket, takes her phone out, and turns it off. Oh, all of a sudden, her womb ruptured. 25 weeks. I did not say a thing. I pulled them out. Three fetuses, more or less. <laughs> Preemies, more and more. The brain is not fully developed. Still, we have made great advances. Artificial wounds would terminate the issue. Eggs could be harvested in utero, but problems persist. The placenta to date is non-replicable. And women without wombs, used wombs, used up, exile, poof, outside the dome. <gasps> women are weakening. I I don't say that. I saved them, not her. She bled out placenta goop. I am richly rewarded for my work with coat de robe. <laughs> <gasps> Wouldn't you like some wine? Mick, my darling, hush. <laughs> you, eat, you, here. Yeah. One, some, some. <laughs> yes, it is. It is divine. You know what we do to the motherless ones? You know what we do to those born too soon, deformed? Hush, Nick. We do not. <laughs> Direct from the womb to your dining room. Aha, uh -huh, very clever. Solution to the increasing food shortage. Mick.
Oh. <laughs> we have no other electronic devices. <sighs> I'm nauseous all the time now. I believe we should walk. They walk out. They return again from another entrance in mid-conversation without the wine, and they are standing on an empty street in the dome. They look around to make certain of being alone. When he opened up. Theoretically. Actually, if we did. When we do. On the cortex. So the areas of the brain. Let can actually Quickly, naturally, with minimal risk prenatally. We'd repeat the evolutionary leap. With improvement, nevertheless. It's a simple extension of existing cortical wiring. Like flicking a switch. Might have happened naturally all by itself. The roll of the evolutionary dice. How did consciousness arise out of matter? From a glob of flesh. Thought. Think of that. And looking down, mm -hmm. looking out, looking in for the first time. All else, I believe, you've considered but this. And you can achieve this. Put together. Unify. Finally. What might have been ripped, disrupted, hurt when the cortex extended itself. Might be reconnected, as was intended. The mind is the brain viewed from a distance. From a distance, it is possible to see. Totality. Ah. Uh, where is he from? <laughs> you, from where? From far from here. Sent? Fled. How did you get in? They wish to measure the radiation content of my bones. Makes sense. Of course. We won't know. Theoretical at best. Nevertheless. We shall try. We will. If you wish. If not, I will be implanting dinner food into Stop the- Stop it, Nick. I haven't forgotten my past. As one must. I am grateful, cheerful, obedient. Industrious? One of us. Once a physician. I work as a janitor now. He bows and leaves. Hmm. 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 He came to my lecture. Did I let a dangerous word slip? Is that why he came up? I don't think so. You asked where he was from, you must have thought. It tastes just like chicken. Stop it, please. Mm, no one remembers what chicken tastes Radiation like. free puree is delicious. Running out. You sought me out. I was there. You were there? Where you couldn't see. What? I wanted to hear. See, I mean. You were checking up. We, we were coming too close to deciding now. You needed to know. I suppose so. Who are you really, Michelle? Who are you, Eve? The woman who loves you, your love? <laughs> A dangerous thought. It could do it that way. Send me. Send you. Of course they could. How would I know? You did not say a dangerous word. <sighs> you could not have been there. No. You were in the hospital delivering. I was not spying on you. <laughs> My darling, how could I think such a thing? You are suggestible. I. Immediately, you doubted me. Well, you set me up! So has he. He has offered himself. I'm not convinced. How could he think it all up? He's using their script. Hmm. They are onto us? If they are, they would send someone just like him. Scene six. Even Michelle at home, Michelle is holding <laughs> the soup bag that is actually filled with the sperm that Tanaka passed to Eve previously in scene five. So, well, what do you think? My phone is off yours. Of course. You vacuumed? I did. I've checked them out. High quality. Are they his? You have a crush. On you, yes. Ah, they are healthy, I can tell you that. Maybe not his. Mixed, I did a check. It's the best time for us. Curious how that works. Women in groups. Phases of the moon. Pulling at us even though we can't mm. see. So they'd all be nursing together. If one needed more milk. If one mother didn't live. It's pure. Somehow. You do have a crush. So do you. Don't get carried away. We don't ask him anything, where he's from. He doesn't want to say. Well, when he's ready, perhaps. Later on, after. A beep is heard. We are happy here. Of course we are. We're on the list. We produce. We reproduce. They're done with us. That's how it works. 
weak womb, substandard eggs. Well, nevertheless, we, we are doing our duty gladly. We need the best. Mm, this morning, two vials in dry ice were on my desk for star variety. Well, for one's own, it's only natural to want. There is five stars after that. <laughs> I suppose four stars is all right. We accept. We might have been asked to report. Did you ask? For the privilege? Yeah, that you mention it, I can't remember. Well, you must have asked otherwise. I must have. They granted your wish. He refers to the soup that Tanaka gave her earlier. Michelle very visibly empties the two vials of official sperm onto the ground. <gasps> I'm honored in that. <laughs> A mark of respect. I am useful, yes. I fertilize, put them in, pull them out. Oh, I'll fertilize yours. I will too. <laughs> First, I'm going to steal your eggs. There were birds. When? No, there were eggs. My lark, my dove, lovers said. Birds coated with oil. Drowned in a stew. Birds on the wing. <laughs> Is one love without birds? We do. Poets wrote about birds. If we had poems, would we have birds? We'd have plenty of eggs, my lark. My dove, I'm gonna grab a handful. <laughs> that sort of thing turns you on. Yeah, it does. <laughs> we are on the list. It's allowed. Mandated, in fact. <laughs> Will you teach me how to do you? Can't. Could Tanaka harvested mine? Harvested. Took them out. I love the sounds of what was. I'll bring you to orgasm just before. The eggs excite. Did Tanaka bring you to orgasm, Mick? Myself. I did. <laughs> my lark, my dove. I'll put them into a dish, show you how to insert a needle inside, squirt some sperm. And watch them divide? <laughs> Indeed. There are a few simple adjustments to make in the healthy zygote before implantation. Oh, implantation. That's the sexy part. Extrication, fertilization, manipulation, <laughs> implantation, additional manipulation in three months' time. You love your work. I hate my work. I implant fertilized eggs. None of them take. She's exiled outside the dome where she carries three or four born premature to be mashed into a blender. Please, I spoil your romantic mood. They used to eat birds, wring their necks. Hmm. Pluck them and pull them apart. Roast them on a spit. Scene eight. Several months have passed. It is dark. A door opens. An empty examination room. I, I need a light. Flashlight comes on. Clean. I, I, I know where things are. Eve should be here. There's the table. Look, lie down, Michelle, please. She lies down on the table. Laparoscopic. Okay, will not hurt. Can you be quick? Let's talk as I work. Radiation resistance. Heat resistance to 135 degrees Fahrenheit. Ouch. Sorry. No, I mean that much. <coughs> it's November now. It is 90 plus degrees outside the dome. Fast on their feet. Two or four as they choose. Hands with opposable thumbs, but front legs as well. Large water storage capacity. Herbivores. Omnivores, when and if. Language. Can you see where the cortex might be? Yeah, I can. Where is Eve? Don't, don't look. Thought connected to the gut brain. I reinforce the vestigial empathy centers just here. Androgynous. We hope so. <coughs> Done? <coughs> Eve enters, distress. Her shirt is bloody. Michelle gets off the table. Oh, oh I'm late. Where are you hurt? It's, it's, it's not her blood. Outbreak of hate. All the time now. Started ranting on the street. Get the blank out of my dome. Go back to where you came from. Two pregnant women, darker skinned. His wife was exiled, unable to conceive. A man stepped between them, young. You can't talk to pregnant women like that. Calm yourself down. Pulled out a knife. Dome belongs to people like me. Lunged for them. Hey man, stop. Step, stepped between, slashed his throat, ran, fell into me on the ground on top. If it had been you, Mick, you would have, you would have stuck your finger in the right spot. Like a geyser, 
was. Blood spurting and heat choking. I, I, I was pressing. I'm so sorry. Life is so cruel, I said. Tell him I love him, he said, and died in my lap. Choked on the words. Tell everyone that I love them. Tell your child that. Oh, let me get this bloody shirt off. Left them on the street and ran. In his body, you mean? You would bear for him. It's, it's all right, my love. No, no, it's his blood. It should, it should say. Darling, you are wonderful, brave, but we haven't got time. Next slashed on the street. The hate comes boiling up, flooding up. The geyser it was. But we must do the procedure. Darling, yes, on the table. We've no time. Oh, no, do you, do you think that I might lose them? Women do shock in shock, shock. I don't want to lose them. I need to tell them what he said. Tell your children I love. <laughs> You will not lose them. Uh, I feel cramping. Let me put you on the table. We need to fix a few things. What What things? We've talked this through. So the ones inside, inside you might Proof. be... Proof. Proof. We are not liable to control. He was not. Geysers of hate are not enough. Tell everyone that I love them. Hmm. Can you make that happen with a needle inside an egg? We can optimize chances. Nevertheless, they will need us, even so. Scene 9. Olva sits in a large upholstered easy chair with a pile of journals, newspapers, magazines, and books in his room. He is immersed in reading. Eve enters from behind his chair so he cannot see her. Olva, tell me a story. He looks up, smiles, puts down his papers, pats his lap, and makes room for the child to sit. Eve remains standing behind. She too smiles. This little dialogue is as if the child Eve was sitting on his lap. A story. About the bad days. When you were a boy, but everyone was good. There was no food, there was no work, but everyone was nice. There was hope. Hope. He stares straight out. <laughs> Eve puts her hands over his eyes from behind the chair. I'm back. How did you get in? The night guard, one of them. Is one of us. She goes around the chair and takes his face in her hands. Hello, Opa. <laughs> Dear. We thought you'd gone over to well, the- Well, why not? Mother did. Mother bought our way into the dome with her doomed marriage, if that's what you mean. I'm not grateful, if that's what you expect. How could you leave us like that? She... I know. Even then, after those things that you said, she wanted to see you. Yeah, I couldn't, Opa. I was at work. I was busy. Work? Oh, you hurt her so, Eve. Your house is always watched. Of course. They needed to think. I needed to convince them that... Yes. She... She loved you. She wanted to see you once before. Sure, I know. I was, it was painful and quick. I'm sorry, Opa. I am certain you are. Hmm. Do you still walk, Opa? I can walk, of course. No, no, it's all right, we can sit. She puts her hands under his arm to help him and gets up out of the chair. But what about... He looks around at everything. They begin walking slowly, with Eve holding his arm, and he sees that she's pregnant. Eve, look at you. You are... Uh, I am. <laughs> oh, I thought... Right. Whoever is right. Whoever is all right. Oh, it's not done that way anymore. With bodies, <laughs> with bodies and sweat? Uh, needles, petri dishes. Oh. Why has it always been you? Whatever you want, ask me to do. Forever, Opa. We always said. You, you've gone so long. Back now. I won't leave you. They let me 
work here, huh? undisturbed. I can broadcast abroad. There are still oh, some. I know, I know. That's good. She moves him toward the door. Some people, somewhere, listen to you. And if there are people somewhere else, your voice is not allowed in the dome. They let you say whatever you want. Oh, the act of speaking oddly remains satisfying. It clears my head. Well, the tapes might exist. Oh, I anyway have a full set. They allow me to speak for her sake. Think aloud, I should say. Here's my latest non-broadcast virus for reception by Noah. <clears throat> Life inside the dome is increasingly untenable. We need not speak of the food, uh, the rumors of which everyone knows uh, uh, of what it contains. More lethal, though, not to be remarked upon, the, the aquifer upon which the dome was built has all but run out. This has not been made uh, knowledge, common knowledge as of yet. Purification of the same air is likewise no longer sustainable. The population is being systematically reduced. Outbreaks of hate are on the rise. Life inside the dome for the privileged few is likely to cease long before. But here, Opa, I'm, I'm here for you. I'm not leaving you. You are a neuroscientist. Mm -hmm. I assume you are in the authorities employ? A uh, lecturer, merely. Oh, you're more brilliant than that. I always hated it when you and Mother Brilliant. So what? Better than not. Sure enough. Brilliant for what? You have always had your way with me. <laughs> I always thought you were a wise old owl watching over me. Hooting. Who, who? What, what? <laughs> Where are you? Let's not speak anymore, dearest Opa. Let's just sit and be quiet. Let me rest my head on your lap. He holds up Opa's arm and walks with him out the door, quietly shutting it behind. Part 3, Scene 16. Michelle is on a pallet bed. Eve, very pregnant, sits next to her. We were in what we called dissenters' prison, as opposed to debtors, I guess. I have no idea of the official name. But you were alone? Chained with not even water. Oh, poor Eve. What about you? Here I am in bed. Oh, we have no many. We have no idea how many places like that might exist. Mm. We were chained to the stone wall, cold, damp, and grimy. Maybe, maybe it was a former coal mine. The exiles are trained to do such things. To get food, probably, or to get back inside. Hmm. They're very sweet, aren't they? Very sweet indeed. Tanaka and Opa are entranced. We're halfway <laughs> there. They are nursing them now. <laughs> We found you on the floor in a diabetic coma. Yeah, half are still inside, but alive. Alive. All of us. <laughs> First of all, I. Uh, and never mind. Go ahead, tell me. No, it's too much. It's good for you to talk. I'm interested, too. What happened to you? Yes, well, it was freezing cold. We both began to think this is it. We'll die chained to this wall, and therefore, quite naturally, it seemed, we began to sing every protest song that Opa knows. <laughs> he taught me the words. We got rather silly, drunk on the words, the international and English, <laughs> French, and Opa knew some lines in Russian. <laughs> he knew songs from what he called the Spanish Civil War. <laughs> it was quite strange, but we began to feel connected to a lineage. We stopped thinking about dying. It felt more like, like we were about to be swept up into large, warm arms. There were voices all around us harmonizing, echoes bouncing off the cave walls. I began to look forward to it, really. <laughs> I thought, 
Soon, all of this unpleasantness will be over. I will be with my own kind. And Opa was ecstatic. <laughs> He began to talk to the people that he used to know. He sat up straight, a great smile on his face. There were so many brave, great people that Opa saw on the other side. It would be like going home. You really think so? I have no idea at all. <laughs> <laughs> you were hallucinating. <laughs> In the state of such mortal fear, your endorphins came to your rescue. You can't actually believe it. Yeah, but we experienced the exact same thing at the same time. Your mother? No, no, no. She didn't come around. Too bad. Oh, I didn't even think of her then. Why, I wonder, didn't she come? Poor Eve. Oh, I did feel that way. I, I never even thought. She never occurred to me. Mostly, I was thrilled for Opa. I'd never seen him as happy. It was as if everything that he has fought for. High in the sky when you die. Mm -hmm. Don't make fun. I'm not. Because at the same time, roughly, give or take, I began to experience the worst pains of my life. We knew I would need a C-section, as you will. No, not if I can help it. You will. Do you see how, how they are, with their sharp little hooves and all? I did not want them stuck in my birth canal. If I could operate on myself, there would be a chance they would survive. You would come or not, but two of them would be out. An animal would find them and raise them. A wolf mother. Your endorphins likewise kicked <laughs> in. <laughs> that was the story I told myself. I also began to feel exhilarated. There's no other word. I grabbed hold of a very sharp scalpel. We found you on the floor cut open. Hmm. One was cut. One was stuck, but hoof, hand, and face were visible. They were breathing. You were, too, barely. I kind of lifted it out. I was coming back away. Uh, no doubt you could have. I would have reached inside. Sure, you could have bled to death, my darling. But they would have survived. And they did. Mm -hmm. So did you. <laughs> I used spider webs to staunch the blood. <laughs> I gathered them from the woods. There are spiders here weaving webs. <laughs> it felt criminal to rip them down, but I could think of nothing else. You knew you would operate on yourself? I thought I might. <laughs> Once to knock a left. <laughs> I arranged my things. They worked the webs better than stitches, I think. Oh, my darling, you were so brave. Oh, labor had been too long. I could no longer feel them move. Oh, you risked your own life. That is what I cannot forgive you for. My life <laughs> is a concept that meant nothing at all. One was wiggling on the floor. I was going to go back for the other. I needed to gather force. You'll have quite a scar as it is. I would have done it. Of course you would. You lost quite a bit of blood. I have performed many C-sections. I knew where to cut. No major organ was nicked. Without actually being able to see over my own bulging belly, I did rather well. You did. <laughs> you almost died. No, it's difficult to say. It was like being swept up in music, going into song. But Tanaka came. No, we had both passed out. Whoever they are must have thought we were done for. We were not under guard. Tanaka walked right in. He was able to undo our chains. Perhaps we could have done it ourselves. He had that old SUV. Hmm. He had your vegetable soup and peppermint tea. Hmm. Opa remembered the taste. But Tanaka was in a state worrying about you. Here we are. And I lie down. Mm -hmm. I'm very tired. <laughs> Did you have sex with Tanaka, Michelle? Rest. <laughs> Your labor is about to start. Scene 17. Loud sounds of suckling. Tanaka and Opa stand together in the clearing, each with a newbie at the breast. They are nursing. <laughs> it's lovely. It's conducive to thought. I agree. Yes. What are you? Thinking of? Yes. Uh, you, I am thinking of. Me? Yes. Who I don't actually know. Who I am? How you did. This. The woman could not at this moment. 
Michelle has lost too much blood. She has nursed. For bonding. For looking in their eyes. Solely. Soulfully. The important part. Mm. So. Supplying the actual nutrients is left up to us. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Quite simple, really. It might have been figured out if given priority, of course. It was never given that. You saw yourself. A simple series of shots. Oh. Uh, would history have been different if... History was meant to be as it was, so there is now. You believe that? I seldom say otherwise. Then what you believe? It is not conducive to thought. I agree. You operate on a standard quite like me. One must speak as one thinks. Thought before speech? Uh, one need not speak, but language is necessary in order to think. You ask me who I am, where I come from. I would like to know. You move to the other breast now. Oh, right. Mm -hmm. Pause as they both shift <laughs> the newbies. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, one is used up, the other fills up. Neat. Evolution always is. Is that what you call this? <laughs> we, Eve, Mick, and I inserted ourselves. We had no choice. Tell me, Tanaka, just what were you thinking when you did all this? <laughs> what we have done. Why? When you violated nature, so We wish to pick up where evolution left off. Where evolution would likely have gone. And you knew the way? You always said similar things. I wanted democratic solutions, not, not engineered creatures. <coughs> I advocated mutual respect, the honor of work, public interest in the public good. We could manipulate to a delic at a delicate stage the germ DNA. Oh, and not bother with demonstrations, the ever ending uh, need to rouse the masses. There are nerve pathways in the intestines. We connect it to consciousness centers in the brain. Yes, with a zap to the fetus, feeling and thinking would henceforth proceed in unison. To be certain, we intensified the empathic centers in the developing brain. This is quite an extraordinary experience. <laughs> <laughs> you felt the rush when the milk came in? A bit like an orgasm. <laughs> <laughs> that is oxytocin, the empathy hormone being released. Oh, I see. Inside their brains, their empathic neurons are growing because of you looking. Your recipe requires human beings. The brain develops insofar as the child sees themselves being seen. There, there, there. Here it is. Lost the nipple. <laughs> <laughs> it came to pass that most of the human race was traumatized. The ability to think ought to have been enough. Empathy was being lost. There were forces at work, economic. <laughs> Nothing explains the actions of human beings over time, but that some essential biological connection remained unmade. Oh, and you believe in the quick mechanistic fix. You, the last humanist. And you, what do you call yourself? I call myself Tanaka. Mm -hmm. No, don't be smart. I am asking a rational question. How do you identify, explain, name what you believe you are doing? It is not a matter of rational thinking. It is a matter of seeing. I saw what needed doing. 
Even Michelle were engaged in similar acts of seeing. Our energy fields connected us. Sounds like a lot of blah blah to me. <laughs> this one's eyes are quite bright. It has an it has an intelligent, inquisitive look. Oh, don't you? Huh? Oh, it's true. You are a smarty, you are. They will be wise. I wouldn't go that far. Keep pouring yourself into them. Scene 18. Eve, still pregnant, is hauling water as she comes upon Tanaka sitting dejectedly. What's wrong, Tanaka? I've been nursing the newbies with Opa. And? He made me question myself. Uh, he has that way, I'm afraid. Yeah, that's why we wanted him with us. You are upset. The past. Reared itself. Tanaka, what happened to you? I saw my family swept away in the deluge. After the rains and the winds, the floods, the water rushed. A little girl of three with the brightest, roundest, blackest eyes in the world. I was holding her hand. My wife, a woman of such intelligence and instinct, we often needed barely to speak. We read one another's minds. With our son in her arms, a fat, smiling baby, fed us the same breast where I had often suckled myself. Hmm. They were gone. while I watched it. Was I trying to swim? Was I, uh, I, I don't know, I, I, I saw the water like a wall, a force I had never seen before. I must have let go. I'm sorry. I, I thought something like that, but I, Tanaka, I'm so sorry. Many have seen what I did. Did what I did. Many have lost everything. Most let go. But there is worse. On the road, walking inland, walking uphill, staggering away from the sea, a woman battered by branches, cut and scared, seaweed stuck in her hair, asked if I might carry her child. She had her baby in her arms and she felt she could not go on. She wished to pass the child to me. Maybe I could carry it somewhere. I was walking. I was strong enough. I passed her. I acted as if I had not heard. Perhaps she had not said anything at all. Perhaps she had only looked and, and I saw, as I used to see with my wife, without words, what was needed. I walked faster, as fast as I could. I walked away from her. I believe she sat down with her child to die as I walked past. <clears throat> Homo sapiens have narrow minds and selfish. <coughs> 
they think only of themselves. They are limited in their compassion. Mm-hmm. I wish to go on mechanically walking without wanting. I walked, I kept on walking and saving myself. We cannot think ahead. We cannot stop ourselves from grasping. We are afraid of death. We walk away, we walk past the suffering of those, not us. The suffering of others does not touch us as long as we walk. We refuse to look, even without a future, even without a plan. I walk on and on. One day it came to me. Something slight. I began for the first time in a long time to be able to bear, to be able to hear my heartbeat. I began to walk in tune with that. I thought suddenly it was not thought. It was feeling welling up. And I knew there will come a day, a time to come, when this ignorance will end. When the heart and the head will beat in, inside a unison, a thrum, thrum. It might not happen to us. I had given up on people, on myself. I, I had given up, but I understood there will come a different moment, a turning in years, perhaps sooner than we dare to wish, when life reasserts itself. And there will come a new, noble race of creatures who are capable of living fully, who want the best for others, who understand themselves as a part of, not apart from, who neither fear nor despise, who recognize, who bear their lives gladly, <laughs> willingly, with restraint, and with joy welling up. And they will be happy, fearless, careful, generous, and kind. Yes, Tanaka, I believe the same thing I do. They would have stopped in their tracks. We would never be able to walk away. Anyone can understand why you did. Not them. They would not understand. They could not physically do as I did. They would not have been able to move. They would take the child, bear the burden, would not think only of themselves, would not live in fear. You need to give birth to the other two. If I could have done so, I would have. But this has fallen on you. End of reading. <laughs> so much. Thank you. Um, since we have Karen with us, uh, maybe um, we, we take advantage of it for a, a short, um, very short uh, uh, talk here the town. And um, I don't know if we have a second mic. Um, so uh, our evening program begins um, at 6.30, so in case you want to go out or have a drink or check your mail, so you know we will do that. But thank you all for coming. There are seats here. If you want to sit down, um, come over here. You don't have to wait there. Also, right there.
And um, tell us a bit about your, your newest book. Is it the first time you heard it? Uh, well, we've had a few read-throughs, but you know, it's always different with an audience. Thank you guys. <laughs> <laughs> and again, a lot is left out. I mean, this is a two-hour play, and you heard uh, you know, as much as you heard. Uh, you didn't hear the end. You, heard, you missed a lot of the beginning. But I tried to sort of weave things together. So if there are things that aren't clear, I'd be happy to. Uh, so there are you know, catastrophes, right? Rising temperatures, storms, yeah. rain, floods. Well, I mean, it's... Is it it's, a... Well, what is it? Uh, it's after, uh, you know, we're in a moment of uh, climate change, enhanced <laughs> climate change. Yeah. Uh, so this is after the deluge, whatever that proves itself to be. Forest fires and floods is what it looks like. Um, and I think privileged have created a... a uh, a dome in which to live, uh, uh, you know, uh, separate, in which circulates its own air, provides its own water. They're beginning to run out of food, so they're using fetuses or babies to add to the to the purity. Uh, everybody's under surveillance. Um, people who are in the dome are fulfilling a function. Uh, Opa is a sort of relic of of uh, an intellectual liberal pa or radical past that uh, you know is, is there. Uh, so it's, uh, it's in the future, but um, I think we can identify with that future, unfortunately. Yeah. Uh, and the, the question is, can the, these three young ones, um, could we create a creature who could take evolution to the next step and live in this world that's just beginning to come back outside the dome, but live with the head and heart connected. That's the that's the question, and that's that's what they're attempting to do. Um, do, do you remember the moment when you said, "I'm, I'm going to write this now"? Was there like a, a special thing that happened, or has it been always on your mind? Or um... well, the uh, this play was written really between 4 a.m. and 6 a.m. Uh, <laughs> it, it was in my mind for quite a long time. I, uh, it's, it's 2017, so um, Extreme Weather was finished, or finished, um, around 2013. So it was about two years of just wondering how to do it. And then, um, and a lot of bad writing. I always do a tremendous amount of bad writing. Uh, <laughs> Uh, and then, uh, and then somehow I hear the voice of the play, and then it then it begins. But this play, I heard the voice of at 4 a.m. always, so uh, that's when it happened. So t tell us a bit. What is your process of writing? How does it work? How do you do it? And in what days? And computer, typewriter? Uh, how, you know, how many hours a day? Or? Uh, <clears throat> well, and, you know, as I said, it, it was it was a long fallow period of thinking. Um, not writing a play, writing other things, but not writing a play. And a then, notebook you write ideas? Uh, I don't write, I do have a notebook, but I, I learned how to write on a typewriter mm -hmm. as a young journalism student in high school, actually. I worked on the high school newspaper and our teacher made us compose at the typewriter. So I always write at the computer now. I, I, I can't write fast enough uh, except at the computer. So I write at the computer. Um, anyway. Uh, and as I say, I do a lot of bad writing. Um, <laughs> so you write every day? How, uh, no. For the day, how does it, like a week, how does day. it look like in the writing, in case you are under I mean, I, I do a lot of other things. So, I, I, but I, I, you know, sometimes, when I'm writing, I write every day. When I'm writing a play, I write every day and every night and every minute of the day and night. But to get to that place, it's a lot of reading, uh, a lot of thinking, a lot of figuring out what, you know, what it is I'm trying, trying to say or do. And I've never written a play set in the future. The, the book is called Plays in Time, and the four plays are very time-bound. Uh, one is, was written during the Bosnian War about a Bosnian woman refugee and her relationship with a an eccentric family, um, uh, and I wrote it during the war, the Bosnian War, just as the news of the rape camps was hitting uh, American consciousness, and that's what it's about. The, the second play in the book is called Prophecy, and it's 
an anti-war play that spans from the memories of Vietnam to the invasion of Iraq. Um, the third play is, is about the US torture program, Another Life. And the fourth play, Extreme Weather, is about climate change. Um, but it's about the censorship of climate scientists by the US government, which of course now everybody knows is happening, but was happening uh, even in 2009, 2008, 2007. Um, so those were the plays that, that were set in the moment. And then uh, this is the first play that's set in the future. But obviously, um, I just taught uh, Octavia Butler's wonderful novel, The Parable of the Sower, which she wrote in the 90s. It's set in 2020 something. And of course, it feels ever more close I think that's the trick about, about the future, is you need to get this moment in time, but also you know, what's likely to happen if we keep going in this way, um, uh, which uh, you know, without uh, attending to what we're doing to the planet and without attending, I think, to what we're doing uh, to, our, to ourselves. And I think the, the outbreaks of hate, I mean, that's a real story. Uh, that happened, the, the young man who tried to save the two women who were being attacked and his throat was slashed and as he died he said, tell everyone I love them. Um, so uh, that happened in California, but I mean since then we've had how many other outbreaks of hate. Uh, so, uh, you know, I was just trying to balance where we are now, where we might go, which would be towards a kind of greater compassion, obviously. And if we don't go there, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, when it comes to a play, what, what do you look for? What should a play do? What is your idea? What is the play you love? I think a play should move people, and I, that's what I try to do. With, through laughter, through feeling, through memory. Uh, oh, I felt like that, just like that character. Um, but some kind of inner movement. Um, obviously, the theater, which is so beleaguered and so difficult to work in, um, there are other playwrights in the audience, two wonderful playwrights, Thea uh, Cochran and Emma Goldman Sherman, um, who can attest to how difficult it is to work in the theater. Um, uh, but what the theater does, of course, is, and, and there's another great playwright over here who was a student of mine, Dion. Presley, hi. And if I missed anybody, I'm sorry. I'm just not seeing um, uh, And Yanni, who read the stage directions, is a current student from John Jay, Yanni Gray, um, a theater student. Uh, so, um, you know, the theater brings us together. Here we all are, and in the flesh, and breathing and living together. And I think that's, uh, you know, so key to the now. I mean, I love novels. I read novels all the time. Um, but the theater is a community and it's a communal experience. Before we open it up to one or two, maybe even three questions, uh, a question, who, who, who are your points of references in, in writing? Who do you admire? Who do you look up to? Euripides. Who are your... Uh, <laughs> Euripides is first, Ibsen is second. Um, the Irish playwrights I was raised on, and that's where I encountered Augusta Gregory, who was a great person, a uh, great theater maker, um, and a playwright, um, first woman playwright I ever really encountered uh, in school. You know. And then I started looking for other women playwrights. Um, but um, yeah, I love the Greeks, and I love uh, Ibsen, <laughs> and, uh, you know, uh, and many others, many others. And, uh the last question before that. So, what is your next? What are you working on now? What is your? Um, what's in your? What's I'm burning? Working on what's raising thinking? money to get extreme weather. <laughs> For um, writing, you know what? Yeah. You know, I just uh, this play is this play is just you know coming out. So uh, this is the play I'm working on. Yeah, yeah. I don't have I don't have anything on the horizon play wise because. You know, it's one baby at a time. Yes. <laughs> it's in vitro somewhere. But uh, so maybe we open it up for a couple of questions. I don't know if we have an additional mic. If not, um, yeah, you have one sound mic. Right. So we start over there. Yeah. Um, Can you I take the also recording? And we hear it better, but we also record it. All right. 
Um, I was very moved by Tanaka's speech at the end and the whole sense of both what would lead one to feel like human beings have kind of failed our chance and we need to take the next evolutionary step. Um, but there's both a feeling, I felt that I was moved, as you said, Karen, identification with him, but also there's, I had kind of a sense that maybe he's, he's, Maybe he's a bit delusional too, um, you know. And I was very interested in the in the the debate with Opa, the hu last humanist, about you know we've got to we've still got to try with human beings as they currently exist to you know to do it better. Um, and I wonder if you feel like the play comes down on either side of that, or or is it all just kind of out there for us to? Uh, Interested, Jan Clausen, who's a marvelous writer, poet. Thank you, Jan. <laughs> so, um, uh, I don't know, actually. Um, I don't want to, the newbies do get born. There is one final scene with the newbies um, where we see them in action and see what these three have created. <laughs> uh, the other sort of thing that I'm working with is that they are not going to survive. The humans are not going to survive. Um, there may be other humans who do survive, but these, this group, because they are giving, literally giving their own uh, flesh to the, there's not enough food. So the nursing is really taking you know, their, their own bo body nutrients and putting them into these creatures who they've made. In a certain way, that's a metaphor because we all do that with our own kids, uh, anyway. I mean, I mean, you know, we, you know, in a certain way. Of course, we want to survive, but we want them to survive. So, you know, so in a way, it's a metaphor. But in another way, it's the situation that they're in and the choice that they've made, and they keep forgetting it, as we all do. We all forget we're going to die, right? Um, uh, and so we go on. And as if we will never die, and that's what they do too. They go back and back and forth, but they do end up creating. Uh, well, you have to tune in. <laughs> they have to do the play. So. Thank you. The good question: the delusion, being delusional, and how how close it is. But another, yeah, over here, the song. Thank you. But I think both are true, obviously. I mean, we have to take the next step, and whoever comes after us has to take a bigger step. That's what I think. Hi, hey, Karen. Um, could you just talk about uh, dialogue and uh, character? Uh, you know, it, it just in terms of, uh, you know, do you, have you ever worked in, you know, narrative? And, you know, is, is, is dialogue, you know, the play, you know, the essential way that you work? And, you know, how do you, I, I've written um, I've written two unpublished novels and uh, <laughs> and a bunch of published short fiction, um, but I live with this actor named George Bartenyev, and uh, <laughs> and so um, yeah, <laughs> and so I tend to write. I mean, we we tend to. We've run this theater for 22 years, and by hook or by crook, in very small, modest ways, we get our work done. And uh, he is, I never write a play without knowing what he's going to play. Um, so, uh, Opa, who is a kind of Noam Chomsky character, and we've had many emails about this Noam and I, um, <laughs> about language and, and stuff like that. Um, uh, but anyway, George is, is uh, that character, so I'm not exactly answering your question, but uh, I, I guess I do like to work in dialogue. I, I love to be around theater people who are impossible, as Kristen has said in my book, in her essay. <laughs> We're all impossible. Uh, it's very hard, it's very you know, horrible, but I mean, there are people in this room who I've worked with for 22 years. There's Tony Schiavonetti, there's Beatrice and, and Sally Ann Parsons, and is that Lupa back there? Yes, and Lupa Lukova, and Kristen. I mean, we've, we've worked together, you know, for what might be a lifetime, and uh, in the most impossible, ridiculous ways, <laughs> situation. Uh, and, um, and it's just such an honor and 
pleasure to be collaborating with other artists, which the theater allows you to do in a way that is, you know, so satisfying to me. Thank you. So I need to write dialogue to do that. <laughs> I, I would like to actually speak to your work for a second. So I've been in Karen's play since I was a, st I was a student of hers at NYU. Um, and one of the things that, is all, that I've always loved about your work is the way that you work with empathy in the audience. Yeah. And I was wondering if you saw that thing in the New York Times last week where they've actually scientifically proven that in the theater, we are all thinking and feeling at the same time similar things and that that is now scientifically proven to create empathy and to create kind of like the beings that you're talking about in this play. Yeah, I, I saw the article, um, but I, I'm behind the firewall for the New York Times and I refuse to pay, pay them. Um, but, but I was trained in the open theater and the living theater. Uh, Julian Beck, Judith Molina, Joe Chaik, and when you ask my other than Euripides, uh, those are my folks. And I think we were all working with them. I mean, that was just how I was trained. And Joe Chaikin always used to say, you know, we're breathing together. I mean, his, his gesture in, in rehearsal was always this. <laughs> um, and, and, uh, and then George, who has not the same training, but certainly Judith and Julian in, in his background. So yeah, it's, it's always been about empathy. And um, I'm glad the Times finally caught on. <laughs> <laughs> and now if they'd, only, if they'd only give me a good review, then they really <laughs> You're always ahead of the time. Yes. Yeah. Well, in Times, please, in Times, by the head. Is it here? Okay. Thank you. Um, that piece was such an emotional commitment to watch. It must have been an amazing emotional commitment to make. And uh, that's question one. But question two, have you thought about adapting this into a screenplay to reach a wider audience? Because it's so powerful and it's so timely. Yeah, uh, all I need is Harvey Weinstein or something. <laughs> 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 that was a good one. <laughs> He could redeem himself <laughs> in our eyes. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, it's always a, I mean, I, I like to make a big commitment when I write, and I like other writers who do make a big commitment when they write. Um, uh, those are my favorite, as I said, some are in this room. Um, uh, in terms of a film script, um, of course, it takes money. Uh, the, you know, the, what's interesting thing about plays is that they are written. Film scripts are directed and rewritten. And so if I could have that much control uh, as I have in the theater over a film um, and had the money mm. and would love to reach a larger audience, of course, yeah. Um, but that's... Thank you. One of the many things I loved about this play was that even though we knew there was a government or an authority, that you placed the choices on the people themselves. And it wasn't necessarily in opposition to authority, but what role can you take yourself that's doable? Um, and I have to say, Karen, it gave me a little bit of hope at a very hopeless time. I thought uh, configuring the political question as an individual question was really exciting, and I just wonder how you how you thought about that. Thank you, Evangeline. I mean, I must say, I had a great deal of pleasure writing this play. I, I know that it is harrowing in parts, um, but that can be pleasurable too. But it, it was, in a way, like a retreat from Trumpism. <laughs> <laughs> and. Uh, yeah, and I think, I mean, I don't, this is such a difficult, <coughs> horrible time that we're sharing. Um, I don't know that any of us have the answer. We hope it won't be nuclear war, you know. Um, but, but I found a great deal of sustenance while I was writing it, so I'm glad you found that in the hearing of it. 
Maybe one more question or remark or Jonathan. Uh, can you take the mic? Oh, thank you. Oh, in witnessing the play, I kept flashing on some recent readings I've done by the historian Yuval Harari. No, Yuval, yes. mm -hmm. I'm losing my mind. Does anybody know who I'm talking the about? Homo sapiens. That's yeah, the yeah. Ideas. And it seemed very prophetic the same way he is, in, especially in Homo Deus. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering if, uh, I was wondering why that might be. Are you, are you a disciple of him, like I'm becoming? I'm not a disciple of his. I did read that book, um, and I thought it was, you know, a, a okay, uh, <laughs> good, good enough. It's a huge success. Um, there's a lot of, there are a lot of other things I, I read um, that went into this play. Um, readings about the Anthropocene, um, uh, all kinds of other things, yeah. And Chomsky, uh, I was trying to figure out his linguistics. Um, and, but, you know, just a lot of reading, yeah. Well, uh, so a lot of reading to do some good writing, so. Uh, yeah. Yeah. No, I think you can't write if you don't read, so, you know. <laughs> right, <it's very> <laughs> It's, uh, it's, and as someone said about history, history is important because you learn why we don't learn from history. And, um, and so I think this is a part of a memory, the memory machine and, uh, to remind us. So um, um, let's give our audience a little break. Um, at 6.30 we start again, so really thank you for coming. I hope you will be uh, coming back. And in your program, and the handout is the lineup for tonight. Um, again, thank you all for coming, and I think uh, applause for the actors. <laughs> Side of it.